I'm going to be talking about um, acute myeloid leukemia and um, uh, the role of transplant, although when I was originally given this topic, I thought it was just AML. So there's a, a few slides at the end specifically addressing transplant, which is um, obviously a big question in, in patients who have this diagnosis. So I'll, I'll dwell on those a little bit longer at the end, but kind of go through a little bit of the background as well, um, just in terms of what is the disease, um, who gets it, what are the known kind of epidemiology, um, what do we know about the risk factors? So is there anything that I could have done in my life to have put me at risk? Um, how are these patients presenting and how are they being evaluated? Um, and then kind of importantly at the end, what defines their risk? which is really how we are making our treatment decisions right now in terms of the role of transplant. And then um, at the end, again, I'll talk a touch more specifically about transplant. So what is the disease itself? So really the, the disease lies in the name. So it's an acute process, something that develops rapidly, um, you know, over the, the time course of weeks to months. Um, it relates to the myeloid cells, which is the term that refers to the bone marrow itself. And the leukemia is a, a word that was coined a couple centuries ago, actually of Greek origin, which basically means white blood. So at the end of the day, this is an acute cancer of the white blood cells from the bone marrow, um, which is where most of our blood cells come from. And in leukemia, it's actually immature blood cells where there's mutations that happen that makes them cancerous, that gets us into all this trouble. And at the end of the day, it becomes being a real estate problem. So what you're seeing down here is two pictures of the bone marrow. The one on the, the bottom corner is a normal bone marrow where about half of the space is fat and the other half is cells. And the one next to it is a patient with leukemia where the bone marrow is crowded out and there's no more room for the normal blood cell maturation process. That's ultimately what gets us into trouble. And that's again depicted up here on the, the top right. Um, where the differentiation problem comes after we have our stem cells that lead to all the blood cells they start to mature into the myeloid cells and that's where our mutations occur and ultimately leads to the leukemia. So how common is this? The short answer is it's not a very common disorder. Um, it makes up about 1% of all cancer cases in America and about 2% of all cancer deaths. And this is data from SEER, which is pretty much our, probably our best epidemiological data. Excuse me, data. Um, and then compared to other cancers, as you can see here, it's very uncommon. So a annually in the, in the United States, there's about 250,000 cases of breast cancer and only about 20,000 cases of acute myeloid leukemia. Um, so it is a rare cancer, but it's a very deadly one, as, as I'm sure many of us are aware of in this room. So who gets AML? Um, it tends to, there is a slight predis predisposition towards males over females and in Caucasians compared to other races, but pretty much at the end of the day, anybody can get it. These are kind of small tendencies, not strong trends. Um, and then this is a, a disease of, of the elderly, so which is one of our challenges in treating it, and particularly in transplant. So as you can see here, as the decades go on, unlike acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a, a somewhat similar disease where we do see a, a fair amount of kids with this, this is a disease where as we, we, we age decade to decade, our risk perpetually goes up. And that's because the, the stem cells are always reproducing and then the, the potential to develop mutations over time increases as we're, um, as we're aging. So the median age of diagnosis is at 68. Um, so other than old age and being and some a sex um, tendency, what else are, do we know can predispose us? Kind of the short answer to this is there's not a lot. Um, we know that patients who have been exposed to radiation have an increased risk of developing acute myeloid leukemia. Um, initially, that actually came following World War II and the atomic bombs. Many patients about six to eight years out started developing leukemia processes. Um, the role of radiation kind of in day-to-day -day life, even in patients who are getting a lot of CT scans, for example, is pretty controversial. Um, that's probably not really a much of a driving factor. We do, know that, we do know that patients who are treated with other chemotherapy, so for example, breast cancer patients who get, who get chemotherapy, down the line can develop subsequently acute myeloid leukemia or MDS, kind of a precursor cancer, as I'm sure you probably heard a little bit about earlier. And then in terms of environmental factors, really the only modifiable risk factor for AML that's known is smoking. But again, this is not a huge factor because not a lot of people smoke and don't get AML. And then there are certain chemical exposures, things like benzene and formaldehyde, which are pretty rare, but again, we do know are, are do increase the risk of developing the disease. And then finally, some rare things, so there are some genetic syndromes that I've listed here, I'm not gonna go through in detail that we know can increase risk. There are some chromosomal problems that can be present at birth, like Down syndrome or, or uh, Edwards syndrome or trisomy eight. 
And then um, something we do see in our clinics is um, there are some other, pre, um, other blood disorders like chronic myeloid leukemia, some of our myeloproliferative neoplasms like polycythemia and essential thrombocytosis um, that can increase the risk of developing AML, and it is one of the challenges of treating those diseases, actually. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, this really is just a disease of, of bad luck and age. So there's not a lot that we can modify to reduce the risk, um, at least uh, from our current knowledge. So um, the development of AML, it's really a complex process, and I just want to touch on some of the basic principles. Um, um, like I mentioned a minute ago, it really develops over time through a series of mutations. And as we've done epidemiological studies and natural history studies of these patients over time, we've really found that there are recurrent genomic mutations in the landscape um, that are consistent and, and lead to development of disease. But it's not any one mutation that occurs at one time. This is a pretty dynamic process, again, that's occurring over a, a prolonged period. And kind of more, uh, also importantly, it's even though all cancer starts from one cell, we know that um, AML over time is a very dynamic disease. So we know based on when we look at these cells under the microscope, when we look at the proteins that they express, when we look at the genetics inside the cell, that there is a certain characterization or a clone that we see at presentation. Over time, as we treat the disease, we know that the, basically the treatment pressure from the, the chemotherapy and the targeted agents that you've heard a lot about can cause some of these clones to respond and shrink, but over time, new clones can develop, which is one of the challenges of treating the disease. And when our patients are relapsing, often we find that although it's still technically acute myeloid leukemia, it actually can have a very different um, presentation in terms of the potential treatments and the risk, et cetera, which is why when patients are relapsing, we're always repeating things like bone marrow biopsies and repeating the workup, because we, we need to understand the disease at every point in time. Um, and then, um, really, we've learned a lot about the disease, really, in the past couple of decades, you know, in terms of the cytogenetics, so the chromosomes and the big, the big mutations of the disease, we've known about those for a long time. As you've heard about some of the targeted um, drugs, um, targeting things like FLT3 or IDH, we've learned more and more about the molecular aspects of the disease. And now, really, with our ability to do a whole genome sequencing, we can really go down to individual mutations in the DNA and really describe the disease well. Unfortunately, although recently we've made some gains, our, our developments and the treatments for the disease have really not kept up with our understanding of the knowledge and the biology. But certainly we're making gains, and, and I think the future is bright in terms of continuing that progress. So once someone is, is um, diagnosed and the disease is developed, how are, how are these patients presenting? And what are we looking for, certainly? So it, it's, like I mentioned earlier, it's a, a problem of real estate. So People develop what we call pancytopenia often, and that's when all the blood counts are low. So when the red blood cell count gets low, depicted here on the top of this table, what, um, the red cells carry oxygen to all the organs of the body, so the individual organs can become stressed. We do see problems in the heart and the lung and the kidneys from that. People tend to present with symptoms of fatigue and weakness. When the white blood cell counts go low or high sometimes, that leads to a different variety of, of outcomes. The white cells are um, primarily responsive in um, responding to inflammation and responding to infections. So we can see fevers, we can see severe infections, we can see problems with the kidneys, we can see um, um, challenges with thinking, we can see heart attacks if the, the blood gets too thick from high white cell counts. And then finally, with the platelets, these are the cells that are involved in the balance between bleeding and clotting. So when those are low, um, we can see obviously bleeding, we see bruising, and we can see a certain source of rashes. So at presentation, general fatigue is by far the commonest symptom that these patients are presenting with. Um, up here, what you're seeing is what we call a petechial rash. This is caused by low platelets. Um, generally, we don't see bone pain in patients when they're presenting with AML, that we see that more in ALL and some of our lymphoid malignancies. Um, we can even see what we call leukemia tumors. It goes by a variety of names, also referred to as myeloid sarcomas. And this is depicted on a CT scan here, where we were literally seeing a tumor of AML cells. Um, and that's the, um, shown here pathologically. Um, so um, overall, like, the complications really can lead to problems with our electrolytes, so metabolic, metabolic complications. We see problems with coagulation, so bleeding again. Um, and ultimately, like I said, with the high white blood cell count, we can see sluggish blood and see symptoms like heart attack and stroke. So 
These are all things, certainly at presentation, that we're looking for. So everybody with a new diagnosis needs a pretty a thorough exam, obviously. Um, there's a variety of blood work that we do in, in terms of metabolic, looking at blood counts. Um, in women, we always make sure that they're not pregnant because our treatments obviously are harmful to any potential baby, and we do see young women with AML. Um, everybody gets a bone marrow biopsy. Um, this, again, is to rule out other disease infections that can cause abnormalities in blood counts and to completely define the disease again in terms of the genetics, the molecular studies that I've mentioned, um, down to the uh, detail that we can do. Um, pretty much everybody gets what we call HLA typing, um, um, which is looking at the, the potential role of transplant moving forward in terms of our patient's genetics. And then we're doing, um, looking for certain serologies like um, potential involvement with um, hepatitis viruses, HIV, viruses like CMV that we know people carry and may impact our toxicities from therapy. And then at baseline, everybody's getting a basically thorough over evaluation of all of their organs, um, specifically in, in regards to the heart, because um, our chemotherapy can be potentially toxic to the heart function. So how are we doing currently? Um, much better than we used to, but we still have a ways to go. Um, uh, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, this was a completely incurable and universally fatal disease. Now in our younger, fitter patients, um, our cure rates are probably in the 30 to 40 percent range. It's still very challenging in our elderly patients, though, with those cure rates being much lower. Depending on the data you look, 5 to 15 percent may be a little bit higher. Um, and then most challenging is many of our older patients who are not fit to receive intensive chemotherapy have done very poorly which is why some of these novel therapies that we've been mentioning are targeted agents that are much more tolerable or are holding so much promise in this disease. So here's kind of the most updated um, outcome analysis from SEER in terms of our five-year overall survival. And what you're seeing kind of going back from the 1970s to the current day is a steady improvement. Um, oops, I don't need some. Oh, I missed the slide, okay. Um, a steady improvement, and the, the reason for this is, are many things. So some of this is driven by our newer and more effective therapies. A lot of this, in, in my opinion, has been driven by the improved management of our transplant patients. So traditionally, the, the transplant process took the lives of many, many patients, and that significantly declined as we've been able to understand the benefits of chemotherapy versus blocking the immune system at time of transplant. And then just the management of the complications after the transplant, which is one of the, uh, one of the if not the most um, challenging aspects of a bone marrow transplant. So in terms of risk, um, I've talked a little bit about this, and I'm sure you've heard about it um, throughout today, but traditionally we really define risk by the patient's age, how fit they were, their blood counts and some of their lab work at presentation, and whether or not the AML developed from a precursor disease like MDS. Um, as we move through the 1980s and 90s, our cytogenetics really started to play a big role in how we determine that. And again, that's, you know, changes in the chromosomes when we're looking at under the microscope. Um, more recently, our molecular studies have started to play a big role, things like FLT3, MLL, MPM1, um, IDH, so these that are listed here. And then again, in modern day, we can really um, do whole genome ex sequencing, and, and we're finding more and more mutations that we're, we're realizing are dictating outcomes in our patients. So again, it's a wealth of informa information, and really it's the challenge continues to be how do we utilize that information in the decisions we're making for our patients, particularly in my line of work, how do I use that to define the role of transplant? Ultimately, there are many groups that have used all this information from thousands and thousands of patients over decades to risk stratify patients, and this is something that we talk to our patients too about in clinic. This is the most recently updated risk stratification from the European Leukemia Net. It's, it's one that's pretty well accept, accepted, but there are others from the Hovon group, from SWOG, other cooperative groups that have come up with similar stratifications. And ultimately, it allows us to utilize a wealth of information that you're seeing listed here and to try to group people into to individual groups that might help us make um, decisions on their treatment. Um, and in the European Leukemia Net, most recently, that this comes out to be three different groups, so a favorable group, an intermediate, and an adverse. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that might um, play a role in terms of our treatment decisions. But we know it predicts survival. So when we look at those same three groups, if you look at who's alive five years out from diagnosis, those with a favorable risk, 60% of them are alive five years out. 
If you look at the intermediate groups, only about a third of those, and at the adverse group, the number is down closer to 20%. So in the long term, we know that all this information that seems so detail-oriented and cumbersome really does dictate how our patients are doing, and we're utilizing this in terms of discussing with you about what our treatment options are and, again, why we might consider transplant one patient as opposed to another. So just briefly, we've heard a lot about therapy, just, but just conceptually. So in our current therapies for AML, in our younger, more fit patients, and again, fit is in the eye of the beholder and so is young, as um, many of us know, our induction uh, therapy, which is the treatment that we get at the beginning of the diagnosis, is still generally basically high-dose chemotherapy. Um, many of you have probably heard of something called 7 plus 3, which is a regimen that's been around for decades. There are many modifications of this, but consistently um, there's not been one that's been shown to be superior. So more or less the concept is aggressive chemotherapy at diagnosis and institution by institution that may be a little bit different. Um, following the induction therapy, patients get what we call consolidation, which is um, depending on the long-term treatment decisions, the goal of consolidation is to keep the, the cancer in remission, so keep it from coming back. Um, consolidation can include chemotherapy or allogeneic transplant. And again, that's a big decision. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, in my opinion, all of our patients should be enrolled in clinical trials because although we've made big advances, we still, have very, we still have far to go, and that should be our goal for every patient is improving outcomes. In our elderly patients or maybe our patients who are less fit, again, the, the treatment algorithm is the same, induction getting the patient under good control. That's done um, often if they're not fit and not for intensive chemotherapy with hypomethylating agents, which you've heard a lot about. But again, the concept here is that the induction is slow, so we're trying to get the disease under control, but we have to do it slower to keep the patient safe. Um, many of our older patients, though, are still fit for intensive chemotherapy, so that still is an option. Many of our patients in their 60s and sometimes even 70s are, are very fit enough for an intensive chemo. And then consolidation uh, is, again, the similar same concept, even our elderly and our less fit patients. The goal is to keep uh, everybody in remission. And with the advent of reduced intensity transplants, which is essentially a gentler transplant with lower doses of chemotherapy, um, we've really been able to offer transplant to a lot of our elderly patients, which in previous decades it wasn't an option due to the, to, to the morbidity and mortality. Um, but again, clinical trials are critical. You've heard a lot about some of these um, today and it's, it's important for all of our patients. So, like I've alluded to, um, really relapse is the enemy in AML, and the, our goal is to keep people in remission. And so when, we're, when someone's walking through the door in our clinics and I'm talking to them about the role of transplant in AML, the, the most important thing that I'm trying to define is what is their risk of relapsing if I do chemotherapy as opposed to if I take somebody to transplant. And that risk is heavily dictated on uh, the risk of relapse is, is really predilected on the risk of the disease itself. So this was a nice paper that was done recently. And what this looked at, this is a, a, a Dutch group risk stratification. So you're seeing four different risk groups here on this table, but a similar concept. And they did a, a big epidemiological search and they, they tried to, to figure out if after my induction chemotherapy I'm in remission, what is my chance of relapsing if I get chemotherapy as opposed to if I get a transplant? So if you look up here at the top, the good risk patients, those who went to, to get chemotherapy after they're in remission, their risk of relapse is only about 35 or 40 percent. That gets reduced with transplant down to about 15 to 20 percent. If you look at intermediate chemotherapy after remission, the chance of relapse is about a coin flip. With transplant, that drops down to about 20 to 25 percent. If you look at our poor risk, um, risk of relapse after remission with just chemotherapy is 70 to 80 percent. With transplant, we can drop that down to about 30 to 40 percent. And then if you look at our patients who are doing the worst, having the worst outcomes, ch chances of relapse is basically 100 percent after chemotherapy. And with transplant, we can get that down again to about 40 to 50 percent. Um, so, so why if transplant is always better, less relapse do we not do it? And that really uh, relies on the, the risk of the transplant process. So I, I would have put a few more slides in this, on this, but just to explain what I mean by that is we now know, based on the doses of chemotherapy that we give and how fit someone is when they come in the door, meaning really what medical problems they have, what's the risk of the transplant taking your life? 
And in the fittest patients, we know that that is probably in the 5 to 10% range, so people who are really fit and not a lot of medical problems. But as those comorbidities or medical problems pile up, the risk of the transplant goes up and up and up. And so at some point, even though the risk of relapse is dramatically less with a transplant, if the transplant has such a high likelihood of potentially taking your life, then the transplant's not worth the risk. And so when patients are in clinic with us, that's the discussion that we're having with them. And um, that's the, the discussion that takes a lot of time, and everybody has to understand what the pros and cons of these decisions are. And it's not straightforward, it's not black and white. I can present the same situation to two, two of my patients, and they may have very different out opinions on the risk. But this is the data that's driving our decisions, and this is why that, this is the, the approach that we're having around the transplant topic. So what's on the horizon? You've heard a lot about these things, so I'm not going to go into detail. But again, we're getting better chemotherapy. We're improving our dosing and understanding at which dose are we losing the benefits and the toxicities are overwhelming. Um, we're getting more and more targeted therapies. Um, some of the, again, most of these you've already heard about. In the transplant world, what are our, uh, our, our major improvements have come in, in a couple of areas, but one of those is we have more and more donors. You know, pretty much nobody walks in our door these days and we can't find them a donor. I would say never, but it's not never, but you know, it's very, very rare. With the, um, at our center, we do a lot of cord blood transplants. So that's one of our preferred alternate donors, but haplotransplants, so that's people who share at least of half of your DNA with you, are being utilized more and more around the world. Um, and in addition, we're getting better and better at managing the toxicities around transplant, and we need to continue to improve that. Um, and then finally, you've heard a lot about these maintenance approaches, which is, again, the goal there is to keep the disease in remission even after the transplant. Because when our patients are relapsing after an allogenetic transplant, and again, in our high-risk patients, that can be as high as 40%. Um, those patients are very difficult to treat and get back under control. So our maintenance, or so our after-transplant therapies, are, are critical in terms of moving them forward in clinical trials and development. So I guess that I'll stop there, and if anybody has any questions, I'm more than willing to answer. <laughs>